Welcome to Private Club Radio, your weekly source for industry education, news and discussion. Broadcasting from Tampa, Florida, ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Gabriel Aloisi. Today's guest is Kathy O'Neill, a 25-year veteran in the club industry, known for her specialty work in member enrollment and member retention through programming, communication, and involvement with members. In our private clubs, Kathy, how are you today? Doing great, Gabe. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah, well, all of us are trying to make it through this crisis here of uh, 2020. What, do you, what are your thoughts on the impact on membership? And um, you know, what, what do you think that clubs should be preparing for here? Well, you know, Gabe, it's interesting. When I think about a discussion around private club industry and what COVID-19 is doing to us, a lot of our words come to mind. Uh, first of all, the whole reality uh, of the situation. What is this? And have we dealt with anything similar in the past? And then you take a look at the relationship of our clubs to our members, knowing that those with the stronger, better relationships will have a greater advantage of recovery. We talk about rebounding. How does that work in a private club when you've got a lot of threats out there? Again, this situation is one of those that uh, is totally, and we hear the word a lot, unprecedented. How do we get our members to re-engage and how do we make certain that the programming and the messaging and communications are relevant for today's situation and today's member? All of that will help us with retention, keeping those members that we've got, uh, bringing them back to the club. It, those same great retention efforts will help us with recruitment or an enrollment. And then if you put all of that together with a well thought out strategy and, and opportunities that we have available to us, again, that should lead to a successful recovery. So a lot of our words, but I think they're all pertinent for today's situation. Yeah, I like that you did that. It, it alliterates really nicely there. Why don't you go ahead and take us through them step by step, unpack each one of these. The first one I think on your list was reality of crisis. Let's talk about that one first, Kathy. Exactly. Well, this is a new reality for us. And, and as I said earlier, totally unprecedented. We had, again, the 9-11 crisis in 2001. We had the financial crisis of 2008 and 9 that impacted our clubs, our membership, and, and, and our whole industry. But see, COVID-19 is something totally unrelated that, that truly attacks the, and threatens lives as none other has in the past. The interesting thing is, is that it, for many folks, there's an inflection point here, they call it, where you've got to determine whether getting out there after sheltering in place for months where you're craving people and social interaction and activity, then is conflicted also with the health of you and your family. And those that are, are conflicted with going back to work for the financial well-being, then also threatens the, the personal well-being. So as I said, totally unprecedented. But for us in the club industry, what's critical is that we take a look at and examine what are our members thinking and feeling, and then incorporate that in our, in our overall recovery strategy. Um, and for today's uh, discussion, I consulted a good friend of mine. His name is John Last. Uh, and he is the CEO and founder of Sports and Leisure Marketing. Um, he served on the national board of the Executive Women's Golf Association with me and, and was a, a really helpful in terms of the overall consumer research insights he provided us for membership then. And for those uh, in your listeners today, among your listeners, if they go to the PGA show, they can find John Last there every year talking about the important consumer research and how it affects our golf industry. Um, so that tells you a little bit about the reality um, in terms of where we are. Um, yeah. yeah, I'd say even in my own family, I see it. You know, my wife's very conflicted about going back to work. She's a mental health counselor and she'd have to have people coming into her office. Lately, she's been doing everything virtually, um, but she's she's in that spot where she's a little un, un, uneasy. I think obviously the there's a lot of things coming from the media and you get both sides and it's it's very difficult to try to make those decisions for yourself. Uh, 
So you're Absolutely. right. <laughs> Absolutely. It's so true, Gabe. And, and again, those clubs that will begin the recovery fastest are those that have strong relationships with their members, those that have communicated well, that have truly gone beyond being bricks and mortar facilities. Those are the clubs that have woven their threads into the very fabric of the lifestyle of their members. And members can't imagine a life without their club. You know, uh, I've heard it said so many times that it's easy to leave a facility, but it's very difficult uh, to leave a relationship. And right. those clubs that have the relationships will fare best because members will be cheering as they open their doors with some caveats as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. We've, we've heard a number of people. I know um, we had Frank Vane on the show recently and he was talking about how, you know, we really need to take clubs, need, club members need to feel as if they're owners. Uh, and I think that that probably uh, really leads into that relationship part that you're talking about too, where it's, it's just so important. It's not just a place you go to, but it's a place where you're really, you know, you're, you're a part owner and it's that relationship is there and the relationship with the staff. You can't get that at a restaurant or a hotel. Oh, it's so true. And what's interesting is as so many clubs communicated during the crisis and ongoing basis, members wanted to know, tell us how our staff members are. Tell us what you're doing for the staff as well as for the members. We're concerned about those special people that greeted us with the warm welcomes and the fond farewells every time we were there at the club. So again, it's that concern. It's touching base. It's very important, you know, from that perspective. Right. Um, what's, the, uh, what's the next R on your list there? So the next R, again, it leads us to in terms of rebound and how do we put together a strategy for rebounding. And that leads us into that uh, behavioral research done by John Last. And some interesting findings that I think that your listeners today will be uh, will, will take to heart and, and, and perhaps incorporate in their strategies. Uh, but the interesting thing was is that John has been doing this research ever since the COVID-19 crisis started. So that goes back to April, late March, uh, all the way through uh, surveys done through May 1st. And some interesting things for you, Gabe. First and foremost, and not surprising, there is a concern and uncertainty or at unprecedented levels. A strong number of those that were interviewed felt that we're probably already in a recession. And that translates to trepidation and belt tightening. So what that means to us in the private club industry is, are we providing value for the dollar? That means that our members and all consumers are basically taking a look at what's important to me and my family. What am I spending my money on and will I continue to do so? So the impact of attrition of members leaving the club, those with strong relationships that have provided great value for the dollar, they'll have the least problem when it comes to when members actually have the ability to stay and afford a club membership. Those that will do so have established that good, strong relationship. Yeah. Uh, a second finding was the appetite for travel was acutely suppressed. Well, you know, again, we're seeing stories on the news. The one last night, the NBC reporter who truly believes he got the COVID-19 virus by his last flight going home to New Orleans. Well, that scares you to show up at the gate after paying for your, your flight and you see that everybody in the world is on that same flight and they're coughing and sneezing and you're thinking, oh my gosh, what am I doing? <laughs> I, I always hated being on flights for that reason before this whole thing, honestly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. But what's interesting is that 40% of those that were interviewed don't plan to take a vacation this summer. Uh, when, and, and, the, and that was, again, up from those that were asked the same question in January. So what that provides us in the club industry is the opportunity for something that was a, a phrase that was coined in 2008, 2009, the financial crisis, it's the staycation. Yeah. Uh, that means that instead of blowing your vacation money on a week at Disney World in Florida, that means that you enjoy the summer at your club. Right. But only if your club is truly providing some great programming. I mean, some clubs really got into it, Gabe. It was kind of fun. They would do an Italian night. They would do a French night. They would do a, a breakfast in the morning for kids with the Disney characters. You could truly do a trip around the world during the summer with wine tasting, special gourmet dinners, uh, really let the, sh the, the staff shine in terms of the things they could plan and do that entice members to come back because they're not going to want to travel. So let's let them travel to our clubs. You know? Yeah. I had so, a month we were going to do in Puerto Rico, me and the family, and that, that's, that's off <laughs> in June. Uh, so yeah, I'll be spending more time with the club. That's for sure. 
Oh, that sounds incredible. Yep. Now, on the positive side, uh, he discovered there's a strong latent demand to get out and do things. 55% up from 41% in January said it was important for my life to do a variety of unique experiences. Well, again, take heed, clubs. Are you putting together a robust calendar of new and unique experiences? You know what I mean? What is what does this mean in terms of real overall wellness campaigns and speakers and uh, webinars and seminars and opportunity to provide some uh, some great things through your fitness facilities and through your fitness staff and some of your local uh, experts when it comes to wellness? Um, all of these things basically are cues for us saying. So if this is what they're thinking. This is what they're interested in. Are we incorporating that into our program? Right. Um, yeah. Do you think we'll see more virtual? Um uh, programming rolled out from for clubs? I mean, we saw that happening these last few months. Do you think that will carry through the summer? Oh, I do. And what's interesting is I think the virtual programming is going great guns. I've seen golf lessons, tennis lessons. I've seen yoga classes, uh, chef cooking classes. And members are tuning in, the Lord knows, more so than we've ever had before in our lives. We had time. And that time we wanted to do things like cooking classes. Uh, we couldn't get out and do it, you know, shoulder to shoulder with people, but we could do it virtually. And I think right. that there's going to be a lot of holdover from that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that should be a real big investment that club should make myself for sure. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you know, Gabe, interesting statistics they were talking about of those that were interviewed that are obviously, you know, officing from home, 60% said they would love to continue to office from home after all this is over. Mm, wow. Well, you know, with a lot of people involved in their in home officing, getting out is something that you are starved for. And the private clubs make a big difference, even providing some, if you will, some, some space with uh, audiovisual equipment, et cetera, small offices available. Many clubs were going that direction, uh, providing that for those that are home officers that need a place to, to go and actually meet clients or do a presentation such as a Zoom that where they want to have a more professional background, you know. So mm -hmm. all of this speaks really well. But the most exciting statistic was that 50% of the latest wave of folks that John last uh, interviewed said that they were ready to return to favorite activities without hesitation. They were dying to get out. They'd been <laughs> sheltered in place and they wanted to open the door and go breathe some fresh air. Yeah. Now wow. of the golfers interviewed Gabe, interestingly enough, they found that the most what we call engaged golfers, those are the ones that are the, the, the more avid golfers, and that represents about six to seven million, that, that uh, demographic uh, represents six to seven million who are responsible for 80% of our rounds and spending. They're heading back to the golf course and filling our tee sheets. Thank heaven. God bless those, right? We yeah. need them back and we need them back as quickly as possible. Um, the yeah. more casual golfers, the less committed golfers were the ones that were a bit more hesitant. Yeah. yeah. From what I've heard from clubs around the country that the, the uh, T sheets are completely filled, overfilled yeah. right now. That's a, it was actually a problem where there's not enough uh, inventory for, to meet the demand. That's pretty wild. It is. And what a nice problem to have right now. Right, Gabe? Yeah. I got to need yeah. something because a lot of these clubs are struggling. They lost their banquet revenue. They lost obviously probably yes. some members along the way, maybe not everyone, but they've lost some. Exactly. And um, there's a lot of holes to fill. So hopefully golf, oh. at least golf operations can fill a little of that. So true. Now, the interesting overall demographics is that, is that the group that he interviewed were uh, those that said they're ready to go now. Those were primarily men between the ages of 35 and 44 living in urban areas. Sounds a lot like members that I know. Uh, and those that were the most hesitant to get out there were women and Demo Democrats, which is kind of an interesting, you know, statistic, but I throw it out there. Um, and John Last is, again, as I said, interviewing these folks at a rate of every couple of weeks and fascinating research. But, but then you take all that messaging, Gabe, and that's going to lead us to the next group for, you know, the next R word for re-engagement. So we've got to make certain that we are doing a great job of communicating that we've got a plan that we're going to make certain that the club is safe from an environmental perspective, um, that everything is going to be sanitized, wiped down, procedures are going to be in place. And we need to communicate that plan very simply and non-dictatorially, if you will, to our members, letting them know that it's going to be a partnership, that 
members will be asked to, to do the sanitizer as they come through the door. Where state and federal compliance is necessary, they may have to wear masks in certain parts of the club. But it's going to be something where we also do what was called social distancing. Now, I really like this. The, um, the CEO of the National Club Association gave an interesting comment. Uh, that's um, uh, Henry Willemeyer. Uh, and Henry said that we really shouldn't be calling it keeping your social distance in the club environment. Let's call it physical distance because we want to keep, we don't want a social distance. We work too hard to socially be close to our members through social media, through communications. So, so we should use the term physical distance. Yeah, I like that. Social yeah. distance. Yeah, I love that one for sure. Yeah, Henry's a great guy. <laughs> yeah, he is a great guy and very, very astute when it comes to something like that. So re-engaging is going to be very important. But uh, we do all of that by creating and magnetizing through relevant programming. You know, go back to those unique experiences, taking a look at what are you putting together for your golfers? What are you putting together for the junior programs? Uh, what kind of social events are you doing? And then very importantly, the whole uh, opportunity to get involved, the folks that are our member messengers, I call them. That's your, that's your board members, your committee members. Uh, and at this point in time, you want to get them involved in, first of all, the planning, uh, the implementing of these events and activities, because they'll spark their friends and others to come and join them. Communication is very important. And then creating the wonderful memories, making certain that they're well implemented and, and well presented to your members. Uh, I think it's very important from that perspective that we let members know that they are getting their value for the dollar and that we are thinking about them. Um, Love it. And that, you know, again, from the perspective of programming, I'll bet you've heard some great ideas. You mentioned the virtual programming, Gabe. Yeah, yeah, I've I've seen um, clubs doing like drive-in movie nights. You know, setting up a screen and doing a drive-in. I think that's a great idea. So there's, you, you got to get creative. I mean, these are, these are times that <laughs> call yeah. for extraordinary creativity as well. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, without a doubt. And the good news is, Gabe, is that all that we do to help with the retention also creates recruitment opportunity right. for yeah. the world. Um, all it allows members to bring guests saying, wow, what a fun place this is, or enjoy the pool with their neighbors or whatever, thinking this is a place we need to belong to, you know? Yep. Um, yeah. You know, what other, what other recruitment efforts are you seeing happening right now? Or are, are you seeing any clubs around the country that are uh, making some, some good headway throughout this? Yes, I think that the headway primarily is depending upon, uh, and, and this is a perfect time for clubs to be, if you will, reopening, because it's the time when naturally, even without COVID-19, our country clubs spring to life over Memorial Day. You see the flags, you got the barbecue, the pool opens with all of the fun kids camps and programs, and we've got to capitalize on that. People are ready for that more than ever, and of course, they're also saying the virus doesn't live well in heat, you know, you're thinking, okay, let's get in some of that heat. Let's get into some of that sunshine. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. think that now more than ever, I'm seeing messaging coming from the clubs. Come and uh, again, make certain that your friends and associates know that, that they're welcome to come as your guests, except of course in clubs where they're having staggered reopenings. For instance, in clubs that their fitness facilities are opening at 25% capacity or dining at 25% capacity. Uh, that's where they're restricting it to members only first as they initially open and then encourage them to bring guests later on when everything is a bit more comfortable for them. Uh, yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of clubs do that. What you're mentioning there where, you know, they're first just allowing the members to come back there. And I think that's good because you've, like you mentioned before, you've got some members, you know, on different sides of the spectrum. Some people are just like, let's get back to normal, but there's a lot of people that are still very cautious right now. Right. Um, and so kind of staggering how, how you're doing those openings, I think is really important. Plus gauging what the member, what the members have to say on this, uh, I think is, is also really important. Do you know if any clubs are, are, are really conducting, you know, informal surveys or anything asking how, how they want their club to be reopened? I think in many instances, um, many clubs are going back to their boards and committees and using them as focus groups, if you will. Yeah. And, and as I, and I like to call them, as I mentioned earlier, member messengers, because, they're in their positions of serving on the board and being on the committee because they are frequent users of the clubs. Uh, they oftentimes have got a lot of friends and associates and have been there. They've got their tenured members. 
So, and if you've done a good job of choosing and bringing on new committee members from among your new members that have just recently joined as well, then you're getting a good cross section as to yeah. what they're thinking and feeling. So it, if you will, supplements John Last national research with what people are feeling locally. Yeah, and that was a great little point you added in there. I don't know if folks caught it, but the fact that you should get some of the new members into the committees and eventually, you know, into um, positions in the club where they where they have a voice, I think is really important. But uh, absolutely, let's get to your your uh, last point, which is obviously the one we're all we're all uh, happy about here: uh, recovery. Tell us tell us what your thoughts on that. Well, again, if you think about all that we've discussed in the last few minutes today. It's basically strengthening that relationship that you have with your members. It's communicating that their safety and well-being and that of your staff as well is the number one priority. Um, And that we don't want to create a, you know, again, a a paranoia about coming back to the club. We want to make it feel safe and comfortable if they cross that threshold and see those familiar faces and uh, and get get the chance to more comfortably go back to what was uh, a, a fun and entertaining and, and very important part of their lives uh, for both them and their children and, and their friends eventually. Um, so I think all of that is very important in terms of the overall recovery plan, keeping in mind that the communication, um, very robust and very relevant programming is going to be very important. Uh, making certain that you involve your very active members, again, going back to your board and your the members of your committees, enlisting their assistance uh, with all of the programming and the grading, and as you set together, put together some of the policies and procedures, makes it certain that you run it by them to see if they have any questions or concerns as you begin that recovery, reopening, reemergence kind of process is very important. Uh, And at every juncture, you know, Gabe, you mentioned uh, informal surveys. I think that some of the best general managers and their staff are those that are staying in tune and listening to their members at every opportunity, whether it's sitting at the bar, getting a drink um, as they come through and they're working out and they're on the, the life cycle or treadmill in the fitness club. What are they saying? What are you hearing? Getting it back to those in the decision-making process and making certain that you're incorporating their wishes as well. Yeah, the the best work for a general manager isn't, isn't done behind his desk, in my opinion. <laughs> it's getting Absolutely. out there with your ear to yes. the ground. Yep. Yes, it's so, um, you're, you're also doing some things with, with club boards and, and whatnot through this crisis and throughout the summer here, you're going to be setting up some new meetings and things. Tell us what you're up to. Well, you know, the interesting thing, the governance body of any club, that board is so critical because everyone from your current members, they take a look at that board of governors and make certain that is there someone like me on that board where I know my voice is being heard. And even the new members as they come in, some of the, the most, uh, uh, interesting boards are those whose pictures are cleverly put there at the entry of the club so that when you come in, you see that you've got a diverse board, young as well as tenured, um, and that you've got a board that's representing those that are using the club and investing in the club as owners, as you said earlier, okay, very good, very good term. So that's really important. But, but a lot of the work is being done through boards in terms of focus groups, catching up with what are members thinking and feeling, uh, doing, as I said, and also phone surveys. Um, I do a lot of the surveying work in terms of the one-on-one, more informal, call a resigned member, and uh, and even though a general manager may have spoken with them, uh, see indeed why they left the club, if there was anything that we could do to have kept them or get them back, and if they ever reconsider joining a club, would they come back to the club? And providing those kinds of reports, they're very important to, to the board and to the membership committee in particular, in terms of as they plan and strategize for the future of the club. Yeah. So if folks want to get in touch with you and work with you, Kathy, how do they go about doing that? So uh, simple email, Kathy at yourclubexpert.com. Um, and, uh, again, or my website is your club as well. So pretty simple. I'm available for, again, as I mentioned, a lot of communications market research. I've been doing that for the last 20, 25 years for major companies like, uh, club Corp and, uh, and a lot of other, uh, companies that own clubs and so many member owned clubs that are now taking a look at, again, uh, making certain they're staying in touch with their members. Uh, and it's a little bit easier when someone who's not a person they see on a day-to-day basis asks those questions. We'll get a little bit more frankness and openness as I take it back to the board and to the general manager. 
It's so. true. That's why that, that is so so valuable. It's, it's interesting when you're when you're doing that consulting process how people will open up and say things <laughs> sometimes that amazing. they wouldn't necessarily. Yeah, it's true. Absolutely. That's but awesome. you do a tremendous job. I want to thank you on behalf of those of us in the club industry for all that you bring to us in our homes, in our offices, uh, the interesting people that you have on your program. Uh, you're the one that, that uh, is, is truly uh, perhaps the master at programming because of all the interesting topics and interesting people you bring to us. So on behalf <laughs> of so many others in the club industry, thank you for all that you do for us, Gabe. I appreciate that, Kathy. It's my pleasure, and it's nice to to be able to serve. And it's the it's the only way I could really keep busy through all this, honestly. So it's been fun to have been fun to have all these conversations with folks like yourself. And what a gem you are! So one one more time, make sure to get a hold of Kathy. We're going to put the contact information in the show notes and right here on your screen. And Kathy, thank you so much for joining us here on Private Club Radio today. My pleasure, Gabe. You and your audience stay well, stay safe, and we'll see you at the club. Private Club Radio is brought to you by Concert Golf Partners, helping to preserve and enhance private golf and country clubs. Visit concertgolfpartners.com to learn more about the recapitalization process.